You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. And now, your host, Jackie McDougall. Welcome to another episode of 40 Thrive. So I recently asked a couple of questions in the 40 Thrive community, and I got to tell you, the answers were quite telling. So the first one was, I said, complete this sentence. My life would be so much better if I could just blank. I feel like a 70s game show, right? But the responses varied as they do. But there were several that were win the lottery, get out of debt. You get the point. There was a theme. And so when I anonymously surveyed the group about their financial state, asking them how happy they were with it, half of those who answered scored a one or two out of five, meaning they're either completely dissatisfied or close to it. But when I followed that question up by asking if they believe the right money mindset coaching could help them turn it around, a whopping 90% believed the right coaching would or could help them. That's why I created today's episode with Denise Duffield Thomas, money mindset mentor and best selling author of Lucky Bitch, Get Rich Lucky Bitch, and Chillpreneur. Denise helps women everywhere release their fear of money, set premium prices for their services, and take back control over their finances. In this episode, we talk about money blocks and how you can clear them, why and how you might actually be sabotaging your own success, and how to start building abundance one small goal at a time. Before we jump into the convo, I have to know, have you tried Audible I just listened to two out of three of Denise's books using Audible. Like you, my life can be unpredictable and doesn't leave me with a lot of time to sit and read. I listen to books on Audible all the time. When I'm picking up the kids, on my smart speaker in my office or in the kitchen while I cook dinner, walking the dogs, you get it, basically anywhere I go. And you can get one of Denise's books on Audible for free. That's right, a free audiobook download and trial at audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive. I don't have time to read is no longer an excuse. Get your free audiobook download at audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive. Okay, let's dive into my conversation with Denise Duffield Thomas. Denise, welcome to 40 Thrive. I'm excited you're here. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I'm like glowing and sweating. <laughs> but you're out at your farmhouse, like busting a move. Yes. So I bought a farm about a year and a bit ago and I didn't mean to. I mean, we can totally talk about that, but I meant to buy. How do you accidentally fall into a farm? <laughs> well, it's like um, a movie where some idiots from the city... <laughs> By think it, you know it'd be a really fun idea. They go away on a country weekend and end up buying something. And I actually meant to buy a holiday cottage in like ten years. This was not something I thought would be a short term thing. And I was pregnant. And um, you know when you nest when you're pregnant. Yes. And they tell you not to make any big decisions because of it. <laughs> I forgot that bit. Um, I've actually bought a property every time I've been pregnant. Um, really? Because of yes. And so I was pregnant, and I was saying to Mark, "Wouldn't it be lovely if, in the future, we had a holiday cottage that we could go?" And you know, I had these romantic dreams of like, "Oh, we would go and it'd be a messy place for the kids." And and so I said, "Well, why don't we just start looking just to dream build?" into the future. Mm -hmm. So we can start thinking about what we like and what we don't like. And so, you know, just to plant that seed. And of course I found something that I fell in love with almost immediately. And it, um, it was a beautiful cottage. It's a lovely cottage. It needs some work, but it's attached to a rose farm and it's a very small farm, like a little hobby farm, but it has outbuildings and other cottages and a, a cafe and just all of these things. And, um, I just fell in love with it. And so now on, on top of my normal business, which I'm a writer and I'm a business coach and a money coach, now I have this whole different thing that kind of grew and I just follow that. And yeah, it's been extraordinary. It's actually really changed. Oh God, maybe it's again, turning, you know, turning 40. I was looking at what do I want besides my work? And I love my work, but I don't think your work can be your hobby. Right. 
You and need I need to have something. something you're passionate about outside of that. And also outside yeah. of your kids. I mean, as much as I'm sure your children are lovely, you have three, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I have three as well. And you know, but there's, there's something after turning 40, where you're like, you need to fill that part that ju- is just for you, I think, you know, it, it will be a moneymaker for us, you know, having this venue, but it's more of the creative aspect that's been really game changing for me. Thrifting, making over antique furniture. Um, yeah, just dreaming about, about possibilities. It's been it's been amazing. Wow. So one of the things that I think, uh, uh, well, you'll have to tell me if you agree, is that you can sort of dive into these hobbies and this thing that's a creative outlet for you when you're able to pay the bills, basically. And when you're able to, you have enough money to live your life and you're not worried about it. I actually wanted to do, I love doing little surveys in my community of the women and, and some of the challenges that they have. It helps me create podcast episodes like this one. And when I ask them how satisfied they are with their financial abundance, almost 51% are on a one or two out of five with their financial abundance. So not good. <laughs> Basically, like either completely unsatisfied or close to it. I asked them what the reason was. Of course, there are multiple reasons, but some of them admitted to mindset. And so what I asked them about like, do you believe that with the right mindset coaching, you could turn things around? Almost 90% of them, I'm so proud of my community, almost 90% of them said with mindset coaching, they believe they could turn things around. And so I bring up your house because, you know, you're paying your bills, you're not worried about how to pay the mortgage, you're not worried about how to feed your kids or get out of debt. And so it gives you this freedom to dive into these other things in your life, how did you get there? Because I've I've listened to both, well, two out of three of your books, mm-hmm. and I know it wasn't always that way. So how did you get into this place of financial freedom? I think it starts with a desire for it, mm-hmm. you know, because everything comes from that. Um, sometimes I meet people who say that they want it, but they don't have they don't have a desire for it, and so when you don't have the desire, you're unlikely to do things out of your comfort zone. You know, we all know that if you're working in a job or you have your own business, it's, you have to get out of your comfort zone to ask for money, to ask right. for your salary in the first place, to negotiate pay increases, to figure out what you're going to charge people. Uh, you, do, you know, there's, there's so much that goes into that, that it is around confidence and mindset. And so especially when you have your own business, there's not somebody telling you, well, here's what we're charging for our company's products and services. Here's what your salary is. Here's, you know, here's our process for negotiating your next salary increase. And so I feel like people get so mired in the fear. Yes. And the bad news is that the fear never really goes away. That is the bad news. The only reason that I can get out of my comfort zone and ask for the sale and keep my business going is because I do have a desire for that money to flow to and for me, it's always been real estate, um, ha- buying my first house, buying my dream house, buying my next dream house, buying a rose farm. And n- now it's like, oh, I want to do, I want to put a new roof on the barn. I want to build a new barn. I want to, you know, build a new farmhouse kitchen. That gives me a desire for that money to flow through. And so I don't get as scared anymore. Your desire just has to be like this much bigger than your fear, like teeny, teeny, tiny amount. Right. And that's enough sometimes for you to go, I'm going to do it. Hey, look, caveat here is that some people have desire shame. They have goal shame. Yes. And they go, but I have a big goal, Denise. So, well, great. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to get over my fear. Your first goal could be, I just want to freaking like pay my mortgage. I just want to pay my bills. I want to pay for ballet lessons for my kid. I want to say yes to things without stress. So that does, like that might be a very, very small goal that you have. And then, as you said, you get to a place where you're like, oh my God, I don't have to stress about that anymore. Well, maybe I can give myself permission to dream a bit bigger. So don't right. have goal setting. Yeah. How do you know the difference between this desire that can get you where you want to be and just kind of wanting it? <laughs> Like the, I, people, you know, are like, oh, well, I want that. I'd love a bigger house and I'd like to do that. But they're not, they're not driven. They're not, it's not a fire in their belly. Like, how do you know the difference? Are you dreaming about it every night? You know, are you thinking about it at 3 a.m. when you wake up? Are you 
do you find yourself reading books about that thing or, you know, finding out? That's when you know you do have that burning desire. But it's also okay to have an idle curiosity sometimes. Mm. I wonder what it would be like to have this thing. And there does seem to be this misconception that you're only deserving of the thing if you want it so super, super bad. It's okay to, and it's okay to have things just for the sake of having them as well, you know. It's okay to want to buy a nice pair of shoes or have a nice car or have have a nice house. I think the problem though is what's the difference between desiring something and like feeling the lack of not having it? Right. Right. Because that's what we focus on is the lack. Definitely. And sometimes we focus on it so much. It's like a real desperate, yucky energy. And so it's such a fine line, right? How do you be content with what you've got and want more? It's just, it's such a delicate balance of um, gratitude Mm. and permission. Yes, I have all these great things and it's okay to want more. It's funny because reading your books, I started to have these memories of some money blocks that maybe, okay, I got to, I got to confess to you. I bought my, my own house, my first house by myself. It was like one of the most proud purchases I've ever made at 28 Mm -hmm. years old, bought a house, Burbank, California. I was like, I am rocking. Like, this is great. When I lived in that house by myself, I would go to Macy's or to wherever and go shopping and I would leave my bags in my car until it got dark out, just so my neighbors wouldn't judge me for shopping. Wow. And would they? <laughs> do you think they even would? My neighbors didn't give a shit. <laughs> like, it's funny. so crazy. And I didn't even remember that until I was listening to your book. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Or the fact that when I was pregnant with my first child, I had a, a really big contract in front of me. They were offering me, like, more money than I had ever made. I was, you know, 30... 33 years old and I was psyched and I didn't sign it because I I felt like I wouldn't be able to be the mom I wanted to be at that particular job. I still have the contract. Like I could point behind me to the file cabinet. Why am I carrying that? It's just amazing to me, like some of the stories that we tell ourselves that are so bogus. You know, I, I think my family of origin, I received the messages that I couldn't be a good mom and be successful. I had to choose one. And so I sabotage my career. Like I just listened to you on your book talking about sabotage. There are just women everywhere who are sabotaging their success, don't you think? Well, I think everyone does, but everyone does it for different reasons. So Mm. what you just said was perfect. I have to choose between money and being a good mom, basically. I think a lot of women have that, but I think everyone's got their own flavor of it so some people they might have been sick in the past especially if they had you know a big job or a stressful business and so they think well I could make more money but I'm going to get sick Mm. so it's like this or this some people it's like this or love that's a big one I can have money or love I can't have both I can have money and health I can't have both I can have money and be a good person and I can't have both money and be ethical money and be environmentally conscious it's so horrible but I think everyone's got their own and your job, everybody listening, is to find out what yours is. And it might be multiple ones. A big one, a recurring one for me is money or be down to earth. Mm. (laughs) Money and be liked. (laughs) Right. Money and be a friendly, down to earth, nice person. Because, and this is where you have to dig a little bit deeper, my family had a motto that they said all the time and they said, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Mm. And so nice is a real trigger for me. And so I have to remind myself, I can be rich and be nice. That's okay. Totally. I mean, think about how nice you actually could be when you're rich. (laughs) You can be generous. You can give money away. You can, you know, enjoy yourself. And I think about that all the time. Even just look at our movies, right? Even kids movies, animated movies. It's always like the, the rich people are the mean, stingy abusive ones and then the poor people are just so kind and lovely (laughs) well that's another thing to to uncover right is what are the messages you had about money and wealth as a kid for many of us we didn't know anyone like personally who was wealthy there might have been someone in the town that people talked about or you know whatever but a lot of ours came from movies you know and tv and so you just said is exactly right we've got to unlearn a lot of those things about what wealth means, um, who's allowed to have wealth, 
uh, what people do with it, what who you're allowed to be in your character and have money. Um, it's really fascinating. And I want people to, to come at this from a place of curiosity, from a place of fascination, not that this you thinking that there's something fundamentally wrong with you because there's not. It's just that most people, especially women, have not been taught that it's okay for us to have money. We've only yeah. been taught negative stuff about money. These women, especially the ones who took that survey, they are not doing well in their finances and they know they could benefit from some sort of mindset shift. What is a money block and how can they get rid of them? Sure. So a money block is anything that is a story, a belief, a mindset, um, that money is bad, that what we were talking about before, that you have to give up something for money. It's anything that is, is holding you back from making the money that you want. But it's not even making the money. It's living the life that you want using money, you know, because it's not money is not the be all and end all. Um, and so I think a lot of people, when they read my books, they don't realize that they had so many blocks because if you yes. just ask an average person on the street do you love money they'd probably be like yeah i like money like of course i want more money why wouldn't i want more money and you go well <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why you might not want more money um and the funny thing about money blocks is there are layers and layers and layers to it um i uncover new things all the time about my money mindset it's usually related to an old story that people won't like me um you know that's my one yeah. or that you know i you have to lose something. So it really is an inner exploration. And what do you do about them? 80% of it is awareness. You know, I, I think to some of the tools and techniques I teach in the book uh, are really useful for that last 20%, but it's really useful information to know why you might be sabotaging yourself. Um, and even just to know that you are in the first place of like, oh, it's not that I'm not deserving of money. It's not that I'm crap at my job. It's just that I think that if I have more money, everything else in my life is going to fall apart. And you're like, you can have compassion for yourself then. You go, oh, no wonder I'm so scared to ask for the sale because my little lizard brain thinks that we're going to die <laughs> by doing this. And right. then you can just be like, oh, we're not going to die. That's okay. 80% of it is cured by that, of just the awareness of like, oh my God, I've got that story. I think it ties in too with weight sometimes. You know, we feel like if I'm too thin or I'm too rich, that people won't like me. And I've noticed both of those things using them myself to keep me relatable. Like that's one of the things that mm -hmm. people call me is relatable. And I'm like, well, what would happen if I had a shit ton of money and I was a size four? <laughs> Guess yeah. what? I'd still be relatable. Yep. People are going to judge you no matter how much you weigh and how much money you have. So why would you try to please them instead of please yourself? Absolutely. Exactly. You know? And I think the the weight thing is such a it's a, such a big thing for women and money. It's another one of those procrastination things. Well, when I lose weight, then I'll do my photos for my website. Then I'll feel confident to ask for the sale. Then I will, you know, be ready. And it's just another excuse like anything else. And actually, I think I did an article like, can you be fat and rich? Because I just wanted to name it. I wanted to yeah. name it. Because... When you look at your excuses, you know, some people might have the excuse, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too tired, I've got kids, it's not my time, I'm too lazy, I'm not smart enough, I don't have a degree, I'm not the right skin colour, my accent is wrong. So all these little crappy excuses that are just in our way and they're not real. They're not right. real. You can be, men can be fat and rich. Why can't we? <laughs> right. Like, right. Look at all the stereotypical kind of rich men and it's like, 30 year olds in hoodies or it's like old fat men. At least for the women in my community who are over 40, many of them have been successful in the past. I know, you know, I had goals to hit six figures before 30 and, and just kept like climbing the ladder. And then I did, I, I remembered those messages. That was my story that I couldn't be a good mom and be successful. But I know some of these other women over 40 have either gone through a divorce right? And maybe they were staying at home and we could talk about stashing the cash <laughs> in, a, in another podcast episode where it's like protect yourself in a marriage, right? If you have running away money. <laughs> right? I, I have a, a friend whose mother was like, she would tell anybody who would listen to stash the cash, you know, to just, just be ready. But I think that we don't empower women to come up with ideas for making that money. You talk a lot about passive income and you talk a lot about starting a business. And I think 
that when women over 40 think about some of that, they think, oh, that's for other people and not for me. So you're very passionate about starting a business. What kind of advice would you give a woman over 40 who has no idea what to do next to make money? First of all, you've got to get your mindset straight around this, that it's, I'm too old. It's too late for me. Every, all the ideas are gone. I'm not good at anything. I hear that a lot where people go, but I'd be starting from scratch. And you go, well, no, you've got 40 years worth of experience in something. And if not one particular area, but then an umbrella skill set of maybe problem solving or, um, you know, helping people. And so we've got to get rid of that ageism kind of mentality that we often right. tell ourselves, yes. especially when you, you think of some of the, you know, entrepreneurs who are always lauded in magazines and stuff. It's always news loves to see what the young sexy people yeah. are doing. Right. Um, so get rid of that. Right. Because there was a thread on Twitter recently and someone asked that, who, you know, I'm sick of seeing all these younger kind of entrepreneurs lauded. Tell me your success stories. And it was people saying, I started this at 50. I wrote my first novel at 65. I did this, I did that. And so it is a, it is a mindset. And when you have the mindset, right, then you can remind yourself, Oh, you know what? What I love to do at 18, I love to do at 13. Oh, remember that little business I started at 28, but then I had a kid, you know, and you start to remember mm. what you have always wanted to do. And I, I, I'm a big fan of side hustles. I'm a big fan of people starting things on the side because yeah, you'd be tired in the short term, but you're working towards something. You know, some people listening will have a nest egg and they can just go, well, I'm just going to start this thing. Other people might need to ease their way into it for confidence or, you know, you might need to stay at your day job for a little bit. There's just a practical thing around that. But don't be afraid to invest in yourself, in your business and give yourself a good six to 12 months before you have any pressure of, of um, you know, of, of making a crazy amount of money. But also sometimes people don't make the leap because they think they have to replace their corporate income. And I'm like, if you were doing something that you loved and working from home, uh, you probably wouldn't need to replace it dollar for dollar straight away because you would gain so much in freedom and happiness and lack of stress and, and things like that. So, um, and then I would say, you know, honestly, getting your mindset right is like 80% of the battle. And then strategize. You know, I, so I'm at my rose farm. We're going to do some weddings here. So I bought a course about how to run a venue. Because the course gives me templates and checklists and canned responses and things like that. And so I think it's really smart to shortcut your success. Find a mentor, find a course, find a program that will shortcut the learning curve for you. Right. That's I'm constantly saying that, that mentorship, especially at this age, it could be your neighbor, it could be your church, it could be a paid, you know, it could be your money boot camp, it could be plenty of things. But we are at a place where being a lifelong learner is the only way you're going to have a fulfilling, you know, second chapter of your life. So you talk about manifesting. And one of the things, well, first of all, I have to compliment you. When you listen to your book, it's like you're just coming up with it on the fly. There's not even a little piece of you that feels like you're reading an actual book. And I love that. I'm like, oh, I'm just hanging with my pal Denise. But you talk about manifesting. And there are a lot of people out there who are like, just manifest it, just visualize it and all of that. And then they don't have any action to follow it up. And so what I like about your strategy is that, yes, visualize it. Yes, see yourself. And I love the story of how you traveled around the world and you you were like, I see it. This is mine. I, it's all mine. But you then you took the steps to actually get it. So can you just share a little bit about that, like the difference between the way you look at manifesting things in your life versus what's out there? Sure. So I think when people started thinking about manifesting in general, you know, there was the secret was on Oprah and it was so fabulous. Um, and people just thought, oh my God, I can just think about things and they happen, you know, out of the blue. So the way I always think about it is the word manifest means to make real. Mm -hmm. That's what it means, to make real. It doesn't mean necessarily for that to be appear by magic. It just means to make real. So sometimes people feel like if they take any action towards their goal, it's cheating and it's not actually manifesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had people say that they go, but then it's not manifesting if I have to actually do things. And I'm like, but no, because your outcome is to make something real. So throw everything at it. And you, I'm sure you and, and I both know this. 
when you do have a, a desire and you are taking action, there's an undeniable magic that starts to happen. Mm. Synchronicities. Someone says, oh, you need to speak to this person. Like things do kind of start to churn, but it's like you have to meet the universe halfway. Um, you have to know where you're going. You have to take those baby steps. And then I see that as the universe does leverage that. You know, I say knock on a door and the universe knocks on a thousand for you. But you've got to get started. And when you're waiting sometimes for those synchronicities to start, look around and think, well, what's another baby step that I can do to take action or to show you the universe that I'm serious or to, you know, to kind of help the universe create my lucky break. I love that. And, and I know it's not just about money when it comes to that. Like, how many people do you see out there who are like, I am open to finding love. I'm going to find the love of my life. I'm ready. And, and they're putting themselves in the different places, especially doing the things that they love to do. You know, if you love to dance, you should go and dance because you'll probably meet somebody who loves to dance. And so you see people like that who just believe that it's meant to happen. But what would you say to those women? Okay, I'm admitting myself. So in my 20s, my early 30s, I was like, this is the thing I'm going for next. Watch out world. I've got it. And then, you know, real life, kids, marriage, all of that stuff, you know, um, the economy, it takes its toll. And we, we forget how magical it really can be. What advice would you give to sort of help a woman get her mojo back in that way? I totally get it. I totally understand because I get that way as well. So Zig Ziglar, he talks about how you have to work on your mindset every day because it's like taking a shower, you know, and if you don't work on it every day and you don't take a shower every day, you start to stink a little bit, right? <laughs> um, so some of us, if you think about that analogy of mindset being taking a shower, some of us are half-assing that mindset stuff. So we're not like washing behind our ears. We're like forgetting bits of our, our body. We're forgetting bits of our self-care. And everyone does it. I do it myself where I start to find myself listening to the news more instead of listening to inspiring podcasts like this. I start to hang around with friends and take on their negativity instead of hanging out with my positive friends. And it's like this chip, 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 chip away at my mojo. So the way you get it back is you start pulling all those things in again as little as possible. So making sure that you are subscribed to a podcast as soon as you get in your car, you listen to that instead of the news, that um, you, you're watching what you're consuming, those little things. Maybe you don't hang out with a friend for a little bit who is negative. So you start to build up your armor again. Right. That's how you do it. Yeah. I, I would say though, because we are women and, and, you know, a lot of life events do affect us. So Sometimes I see people who have a baby and then they're, they're like, they're putting so much pressure on themselves to get their mojo back straight away. Mm. Like I've got a friend who's got a toddler and she just had triplets oh. and she's, she's like, why aren't I updating my blog every week? And I was like, oh, <laughs> babe, can you not be so hard on yourself? You know, some listeners are going through menopause. Like there's times yes. where we're not going to be, at a hundred percent and that's okay. And it might even be in a month that we, we have to really honor our cycle in the month. And there's a lot of people who talk about this. Kate Northrup talks about it. Mm -hmm. Sammy Fleming talks about it. Ezzy Spencer talks about running your business with, with moon cycles. Lisa Lister has books about um, honoring your period cycles. And, you know, there'll be people who have written about it from a menopause perspective. Um, we do have to honor the fact that we are cyclical creatures right. and we're, it's really hard on ourselves to think we have to be 100% all the time and beat ourselves up over that. It's okay to have seasons of life. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think hearing it from someone like you who, first of all, you know, I'm sure you have a team that are brilliant in getting your Facebook ads up there and your promotional. In, but in reality, you may have shot all those videos in one day. <laughs> <laughs> Three, over three days. Yeah. And you're not constant, constant. Yeah. But the way that we yeah. work, it's like, it looks like we're constantly available and working. And then people get this crazy idea that that's what they have to do and they burn out and they're miserable. And so I love that you and all of these other women are giving that permission to take a minute to walk around your farm, to paint old furniture, to do whatever it is that helps you sort of 
disconnect and recharge? Well, I think buying the Rose Farm for me totally recharged my passion for my actual business Mm. because I was getting my cup filled. And I remember the first day I hired a massive big truck. I was super nervous to drive it. It was so out of my comfort zone. And as I was getting in the truck, I thought, it's been a while since I've been out of my comfort zone like this because my business is very predictable, I guess now. And I mm-hmm. love it, but you know, it's, it's been a while since I've been really scared about something. And so I got in this big truck and I spent the whole day picking up furniture from Facebook marketplace that I'd been buying, like all antique stuff and then finding something on the road. And, and I finished the end of the day and I'd been climbing in and out of the truck and I thought, I don't need to go to the gym ever. <laughs> right. It's stuff like this. And I remember that night I slept like a baby And Mark just said, you look so happy. And I don't Mm. think we have to get all of that from our business. And we don't have to, I feel like I have to make a disclaimer. I love my business. I love my clients. And it's not that. It's just that we can't have, we can't put all our eggs in one happiness basket, whether it's our family, our husband, our relationship, our friendships, you know, we need to get our happiness from a lot of different, different ways. And, and mine happens to be this, you know, someone else's could be, something different but I really highly recommend everyone gets a hobby outside of their business too and um what I love about the farm here is it's very deliberately decorated like it's your grandma's house and that's a design trend at the moment and it's because all the things that are going on in the news and all the things that are happening globally and all the things we're stressed about it's like almost people want to go back to a time where you'd go to your nan's house yes you didn't you didn't have a phone there was no tv well, my nan had three VHSs. She had Torval and Dean doing their award-winning ice skating thing. She had Phantom of the Opera and like one other thing. But you'd go and she'd make you a cup of tea and soup and hot buttered toast. And you'd sit and read in one of her cozy chairs and there was lamps everywhere. And that's what I'm creating here. So people can come for a business retreat, come for a yoga retreat, come for, a, you know, to, just to smell the roses and come away reinvigorated for their business. And I, I ran my first business retreat here um, a couple of weeks ago. And I said to them, we're not going to sit and talk about strategy because you know all the things. You can Google all the things, but you're not giving yourself space to make those decisions. And you're not giving right. yourself something else for your eyes to look at and get pleasure from. And so, yeah, so that's what this place is for, for me. That's such a great reminder because I think we get into this, especially those who start a business and and feel like, oh, the business has to, I have to do this 24 seven. And, you know, I'm I'm sure many of the women are are working from home, like I am. And sometimes you feel like you're never not working when you're in that space. So it's really important to get out. Nature is just powerful. And I think I didn't even have an appreciation for nature the way I do now until after 40. Mm. For sure. Because you're like, wow, it's just like the most basic things are miraculous. That's true, but that's probably a joy that a lot of us experienced when we were younger, when we, you know, did craft projects. And it's just reminding yourself what gave you joy. And that right. could be a clue to your business. It could be a clue to your next hobby, or it could just be a, a clue to how you need to fill up your cup. You're absolutely right. So I've listened to Lucky Bitch and Get Rich Lucky Bitch. And I love, I'm just like, we're just going to, and I love that you joke that like the next one is lazy bitch, but (laughs) I go to Chilpreneur instead. (laughs) Yes. Chilpreneur is my next one. So one of the things I loved was in the first book, you read it. There were certain places where the editing didn't happen. You just, you were like reading and then you made a mistake and then you just read it again. And as a podcaster and as I've worked in television, like You have no idea how freeing that was because I'm thinking she has sold a shit ton of books and has built a business. And I love the way you constantly, in a good way, send people to your your money boot camp in these books and and the bonuses are like lead generators and all of it. It's just all seamless. But one of the things I noticed with women over 40 is we want to be perfect. And so we're not going to launch that book. We're not going to send that resume or, you know, even just like call that person until we have all of our ducks in a row and we're perfect. And your book is a huge example of you don't have to be perfect. Just do it anyway. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, those first two books, they've had like four covers. 
everyone thinks that if they create something, that's it. It's in cement. It's that's it forever. And it's, it's not, you know, you can change most things. You can negotiate things. You can, you can make things better, but you can't improve on nothing, you know? And actually at the retreat, we had a, a lady there called Amy Cook from New Zealand. And she said, it will sell better if it exists. <laughs> and we all just went, fuck yeah. We were just like, oh yeah, because we're sitting there going, well, what if I do this? Will it sell better if I do this, this, and this, but most people haven't even started. And mm. so they're waiting for all of those things to be perfect before they even get started. And so they never sell a thing. Yes. And I always say to people too, like your first sale is your most profitable, not from old school reality math of the hours that you put in and the costs that you put in, not at all. But that first sale is a seed of a promise that could make you millions of dollars if you wanted to, could create freedom for you and your family, could buy you a rose farm. So that first sale is the most profitable because somebody paid you to overcome your resistance, your fear, your perfectionism, your procrastination, the learning curve that you will never, ever forget. You know, you do a sales page the first time it's so painful. It doesn't matter if you change businesses. It's not any more painful than the first time to do that. Mm. You retain that skill for any business that you have. So that first sale is so precious because 99% of people probably never even get to it. Right. It's so true. I mean, that's the difference between somebody who has a bestseller and and the person listening right now. The difference is that they did it. <laughs> they actually finished the book and the person listening may not have. And it's not that the people out there are smarter or more talented. They don't have more resources or more time. It's just that they actually did it. That's it. How many times have you seen something and you're like, I could have done that, but you didn't. Times. You didn't do it. <laughs> and I mean, take Lucky Bitch, for example, right? I wrote that in 2011. Mm. Um, so, you know, nine years ago. And it was not perfect. It had a ton of typos. I wrote it half in British English, half in American English, which pissed ever so many people oh. off. Because they're like, pick, pick it. Are you going to do English? like US or UK? I did half, half. But that book, and I have the original here, actually, that book has made me $10 million. Wow. And that, that was from making such an imperfect first version, shonky cover. It's gone through several covers and then Hay House bought it and re-released it a couple of years ago. Having a book got me on podcasts. Mm -hmm. Having a book got me to talk about the process of writing a book to people. Um, you know, it, it was, it was the seed and it was so crappy. <laughs> <laughs> but it but you did it and it and I it made you 10 million dollars and look at you now money doesn't make you perfect either right and i love that you say that regularly in your book you actually direct people to amazon to your one star reviews <laughs> you yeah. be, because they're so i mean first of all they're ridiculous the people complaining about the language i'm like you downloaded a book called lucky bitch and then you're offended that there's some language i'm like mm. This one's on you. This is on you, Tim. You know. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's men too. I'm like, why are you reading this book? And I do that one. I actually don't read any of my reviews, good or bad. Yeah. Um, I don't read any email, good or bad. So at the start, when I first hired an assistant, she would pass me along. Oh, this person wants to send that. Like, they love you. I just want to pass this on. And I, I was like, but unless you're passing on all the shitty ones, it's none of my business. Mm. I can only offer what I can offer. So I always do what excites me first, what's easy for me. And then I find the audience that needs that thing. I've never reverse engineered it the other way. I've never gone, who, what is the target market I could service? And then let me pretzel myself to suit that person. Some businesses can do that. For me, I, I just needed to... I can only offer what I can offer. I can only tell people what I know. And that has to be good enough for those people. So that means right. that I can't read the good reviews. I can't read the bad reviews because it's none of my business. I just want to put out what I can put out and hope that the people who need it will find it. And I hate stuff too. I don't even feel bad about the people giving me a one-star review. because I wish I had the courage to write one-star reviews sometimes <laughs> for, for books that I hate. I love, I love the fact that they've taken time to do that. So you can't take it personally good or bad because yeah. otherwise you're like, they love me. They hate me. They love me. They hate me. And you're on this roller coaster. I want to keep a very calm equilibrium in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way to do that is to ignore like 99% of the, the things that are coming at me and try and do the things that mostly bring me joy. And that doesn't mean like I still have to do things in my business that I don't like, like paperwork and taxes and 
stuff like that. That's inevitable. But I don't really take it on. Like, I'm just kind of like, eh. Yeah. Whereas I do see that's one of the biggest things for women in business. We take everything personally. And mm. I understand why, but you have to shelter yourself from some things, whether it's taking yourself out of your inbox or, you know, setting up some canned responses for, for tricky situations or saying no to some things. Um, because we do, we do take it personally. If I read those reviews all the time, I probably would take it personally too. So I have to, right. I have to protect myself from that. Right. And yeah. Like I don't read DMS on Twitter. That's one of my things too. I don't <laughs> like, I, int- I honestly, I interact with people all day long on Instagram, but Twitter does not feel good to me. So I just ignore it. Yeah. So sorry if anyone's tagged me on Twitter. I, I, <laughs> I think it's okay to have rules for yourself like that too. Maybe it's you, you know, you say, I won't answer DMs on this particular platform and point people towards, you know, it's okay to corral people into where they would, what works for you. Cause otherwise you won't do it, you know? Right. And, and I think a big part is consistently showing up and, you know, being consistent. And we sometimes think we just have to be everything to everyone and I'm okay not to be. We always have to take care of our own needs first. Yes. Yes. That is a, a, a regular lesson for myself, for my community. It's just, I mean, self-care is sometimes the last thing on our list, but the most important. You're absolutely right. So let me ask you this. If somehow everything that you're doing is just wiped clean, there's no money boot camp, there's no anything you're doing now, and you had to start over, what would you do? Well, personally, I think I would write more books. And as a creative, you know, I think we've all got ideas in the back of our head. One thing I was thinking yesterday, I was like, if I was just to kind of retire from business, I'd probably write like romance, silly romance novels or something <laughs> like that. Um, and I, like I would do, I write like nice guy porn, I've called it because I hate all the romance stories. It's always like horrible, narcissistic guys. And I'm always like reading it going red flags. Like I just want to coach her out of that relationship. And it takes me right out of the romance of it. So I was right. like, yeah, I'm really going to write. I'd like to write movies. I'm writing a screenplay at the moment on top of everything else. So I would probably go more into that. And I think I would actually... I, I'd need some discipline around the, the writing too because I still don't even really consider myself a writer. I've got three published books and I've written many, many other books as well. But I still don't have that identity as a writer and I think it's because I don't sit down and write every day. Um, mm. So I, I would totally do that. And then I think it's really fun people who are starting businesses now, especially in the online space, you can totally leapfrog technology. You know, someone like me who's had an online business for 10 years, some of my systems are so clunky, but the amount of effort and time to change systems is enormous. And so I see sometimes people coming in, they like have a business for six months and they can go into like the easiest tech and there's no real gatekeepers now for starting an online business. Everything is kind of easy for you and there's apps and there's everything's so easy. And I think when I started, you know, there was a lot more clunky systems having to talk to each other and and things like that so I think don't get discouraged if you're just starting now because you've got a huge advantage over someone you know like me who's been around for such a long time and has it's opportunity costs to change systems and to be more nimble is is tricky right and Mm. you know one of the things that is available now is there's so many opportunities for passive income and I think that women they don't even, first of all, know even what that means and how that would look, you know, just to, to be able to take something that you know, what do they say? You only have to know 10% more than the people you're teaching, really? I don't care if you're like, if you bake cakes and that's your passion, you could, you know, do a video or, or a tutorial and images, whatever you want to do and teach other people how to bake, even if it's one specific cake. Like say you took Frozen, <laughs> the, the movie Frozen, and you made a great Anna cake or whatever it is, you could literally teach a course how to make an Anna cake and make lots and lots of money off of it. You know what I've bought recently? Like I, if I think of passive income products of other people that I've bought, I remember at three o'clock in the morning, uh, my kid wouldn't sleep and I was Googling how to make your six month old baby sleep. And I bought an ebook right there on the spot for how to get this is so smart because she niched it down. There was multiple different options. How to get your six-month-old breastfed baby to sleep. Wow. And you could buy the, the four-month one. You could buy the seven-month one. You could buy a um, formula baby versus a breastfeeding baby. And I was like, she's written it for me. 
<laughs> made it really easy to buy that I could do it on my phone. I could pay with yeah. PayPal so I didn't have to find my credit card because I was sitting in the dark breastfeeding mm-hmm. and I could read it straight away. It was like a 10 page ebook. And I think I paid like $20, $30 for it, you know, and I've, I've bought similar things of like how to prepare a month's worth of freezer meals. I could, you could find any of those things yourself by Googling, but mm-hmm. I wanted to find a specific solution for me. I've got so many little eBooks and things because I'm someone who wants to find a solution. Mm-hmm. I, and I don't mind paying for it. So sometimes people go, well, I wouldn't do that because it's so easy for me. Yeah, it is easy for you. That's why you should teach it to someone else. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Like the amount of, so some of the silly things I Google that I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I can do that. So if someone's got that and they've curated it, added some value, like for example, that freezer meal thing. Mm-hmm. So I bought an ebook about how to sit and prep and make a month's worth of freezer meals in one day. Wow. Part of that was checklists of what to buy, shopping lists of what to buy. Um, how to? You might assume that everyone knows how to do X and they don't. So it was like step by step of how to do it because I'm not a good cook. I don't know how to do stuff. Make it really easy for me and I will buy it. So don't assume everyone's like you and they know the things and that they're not willing to pay for a solution. We have to be in our own corner and yes. we have to be in each other's corner because there is there is a lot, you know, the wage gap is real. Sexism is real when it comes to women and money. You know, our, our mums probably couldn't even get bank accounts and personal loans. You know, and I, I know when I started my business, I was a couple of years in, I was already at the million dollar mark and I got rejected for a credit card. My husband started his brand new business and he had a credit card within the first week. And I still, I look at that and I go, is that a coincidence? I don't know. And you know what that is as well is because all of our assets, often the male gets put on as the primary asset holder and the woman is the secondary asset holder. And a lot of women don't know this until they get divorced and they realize that even though it looked like joint accounts, they're actually the secondary account holder. So there's so much sexism that still exists for women and money. Yes. So let's not add to it by buying into those stories. I just really appreciate the work you're doing. And the more I'm all about empowering women and the more women you set free out in the world <laughs> who believe that they're worth it and that their value is high and that they should go for whatever it is they desire, the better a whole world will be. Absolutely. The ripple effect. Every single woman who changes their mindset about money teaches it to their kids, to their girlfriends, to their clients, to their suppliers. It has such a ripple effect. Yes. Beyond, you know, beyond just us. Every single woman can empower other people as well. And um and yeah, I think the world will look very different for our daughters. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. And your money boot camp now is open all year or only open at certain times? Yep, it's open all year round. And but I would say people start with the book. See if you okay. like my style. See if you don't mind a little bit of swearing here and there. And then um, we do monthly calls for boot camps. We do them at the end of the month. So mm-hmm. I always say to people like the earlier you join, the more calls you get during the year. And um, and it's a beautiful community where people can talk honestly and openly about money. We celebrate people making their first million dollars. We celebrate people making their first dollar because That's we know fantastic. it's the same amount of work. It's the same amount of mindset work. And, yes. um, and it's a beautiful place. So we'd love to see more people in there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, everybody. Uh- Thank you so much for listening. Think about that friend who could use this episode. Are you really going to hold back and not help her out? Please share this. And if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. Do it now. You'll never have to look for another 40 Thrive episode again. Until next time, take care and keep thriving.